Today I'm going to talk about what I've learned after a full year of farmer's markets. I've been thinking a lot about what I've learned over this past year doing farmer's markets and I know a lot of you guys have questions about can you make any money doing it? If so, how much money can you make doing it? What are the time constraints involved? How do you, how does it all work? So I thought today I would answer all of those questions. I wanna talk about how much I actually made this year and just some of the things I've learned and some things to consider if you are wanting to get started with it too. Some of the things I'm gonna to mention today, we did really well and I'm gonna continue doing. Other things we didn't do so well, at least not in the beginning and it wasn't until more recently we realized like these things. So I'm gonna give you tips on all of that. Uh, and today's video is sponsored by Cricut, which let me tell you, personalizing your booth and your products, getting that brand voice, especially right from the beginning, that feel, that experience of coming to your booth is so important. So we started using our Cricut machine to personalize signage and our banner and like our entire booth and give it that like brand voice and an experience right from the beginning. And I feel like that really leveled up um, our year, like the entire year um, of farmer's markets. Before we get started though, I did wanna fill you guys in on the sort of products that we were selling uh, at our particular booth, if you're new. So I started out at the farmer's market as a flower farmer. So my goal was growing plants, arranging like mixed bouquets. I also did some jar bouquets and arrangements. I did wreaths, I even grew and sold some plant starts in the very beginning and threw in other products along the way and our chicken eggs, we have uh, backyard chickens. So that's what I was selling. But when we did our booth, my mom and I kind of teamed up. So I had a flower farm, like I was selling arrangements and my mom was actually doing baked goods. So our overall booth was more of like a family farm booth. Mountain View Family Farm was our booth name, our business name. So I'm kind of gonna be able to give you tips regardless of the type of product, whether you're selling meat or cheese or I don't know, jewelry or flowers, whatever you, you're doing, these will apply to whatever you're doing at the market. So let's get into it. The first thing that I learned is that you can definitely make a serious income at the farmer's market. What's important is to find a market that suits your products. So find a market where it's gonna make sense. It's gonna put you in an area where people that are coming to the market are gonna be interested, they'll be able to purchase from you. For instance, um, we live in a town that has a lot of visitors coming through in the summer months, uh, and there's also the regulars, so it's like a good mix of people traveling and people who are there every single week. If you were, let's say, a meat vendor, you're probably gonna do pretty good with the regulars. You're gonna make a serious income because people will get used to your quality. If you're grass-fed, people really appreciate that if they're going to farmer's markets. Um, but if you live in a town where it's like, everybody is traveling, nobody really has a kitchen, might be a little bit more of a struggle. So if you have multiple markets to choose from, choose a market that's gonna be the best fit for you. Um, another thing uh, uh, in regards to that and being able to make a serious income is you don't need to be the cheapest at the market to succeed. Um, and just a practical experience, like my experience from this past year, I wasn't the only one selling flowers, so how I'm able to make a profit and make a good income and sell a lot of bouquets every single week is focusing on doing what I do really well. I never made a bouquet that had flowers that weren't gonna last you know, a week. I wanted those flowers to be as fresh as possible so that if you've bought a bouquet from me before, you know the next time you buy a bouquet, it's gonna be just as good and it's going to last and it's gonna last better than other flowers you've had before. So quality was an emphasis of mine. Also, unique flowers was something that I really emphasized. So things that you don't necessarily always see. I incorporated sunflowers when it was you know, starting to get into fall and we had them blooming. And I loved being able to you know, share with people what was new and fresh and what we've got going on this week. So my focus was more on a mixed bouquet and compared to the other vendors in the farmer's market, mine was more of like mid range. So my bouquets range from 25 to $35, just depending on what was, you know, fresh and how big they were for that week. But on the other side, I had a, a vendor, this was just like a few booths down from me, and they also do like a family farm approach, more veggies, and they do some like smaller, like 
bouquets of flowers, but more simple flowers like marigolds, the long stem ones, um, and zinnias, things like that, that went along with their, their veggies, but there wasn't as much like design to it. Every week, like kind of a smaller bunch and kind of like a round shape, which is great, but her price point was definitely a lot lower than mine. And I know the time to put those together and to grow those is also different than mine. So even though she could have a bouquet one week for $10 and I have a bouquet for $35, this was last week, I still sold a ton of bouquets, like $600 in flowers. And she still had two bouquets at the end of the market. So just because you have somebody else in your market who's selling something that's similar, like they're both flowers, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't both succeed. She was wanting to add you know, some color to her booth, grow some flowers along with the vegetables and bring them to market and sell them you know, just easily, just like they do with the veggies, just a quick bunch and easy to sell to her customers. And especially those who just want something simple for their table. Whereas my product and my take on it was a little different, more of like an experience and learning about new flowers, things you wouldn't necessarily um, have access to like from a local farm, but they are a higher price point. So something either you'd save up for, maybe instead of getting a, a quick little bouquet every week, something people would get twice a month or maybe just once a month, depending on you know budget. That being said, I still had people who would come and get two bunches every single week. Um, and those are more of like your regulars. They get used to your quality. They start to appreciate your style. So if you want to be profitable, you can be but keep in mind that your product is not the same as somebody who's maybe way undercutting you as you maybe view it that way, like, oh, they're undercutting the market. No, they're not necessarily undercutting you, but it's just a different product. And you you might get comments, you know, I had one person I think complain about the price of my flowers and she said, a, a bouquet like this, I can get this at the um, Seattle market for like $10 less. And I was like, oh, wow, like that's a great deal. That's just how it is. <laughs> like if you wanna make a profit and you know the value of what you're selling, you know how long it takes to produce, you know the costs going into your products, then you don't need to doubt what you're charging. But definitely you can make a serious income at the market. We'll talk a little bit more about specifically what I made and hourly, all that stuff in a little bit here. The second thing I learned is that you need to have realistic expectations as to what it takes time-wise to go to market. And I don't even mean just producing your products, like products aside, whatever you're making for the market aside, but with getting to the market, setting up, take down the time. And this is something I didn't fully realize until like the end here, like looking back at the end, like towards the end of our season here, I didn't actually sit down and time all of that out. So what I mean by this is in the morning, you know, before I go to market, I've got to load, I've got to get up early. I've got to load everything up into my trailer, into my car. You've got a cash box. You've got your card readers. You've got to make sure your phone's charged. You've got to, all of the prep that gets ready. Let's say for me to load all of the flowers and all of our signage and our tents and all of that up, let's say it takes me about an hour and a half to get everything loaded up and leave. Then how far are you driving to the market? So our market's about 30, maybe a little more minutes away. So we're already at two hours there just in getting to the market. And now we've got to set up. So for us, we had a double booth, like a large tent, which means more tables. So to set all of that up, we would get there about seven, sometimes a little later, but ideally to set up comfortably, we would get there at seven in the morning and the market opens at nine. So that's two hours. So we're already at four hours there. The market lasts from nine to one. So that's four hours of actually working at the market. So we're already at eight hours, then add on time to take down. So now we've sold everything and we've got to take everything down. We've got to put the leftover flowers. We actually sold to like our leftover flowers. We take them to a local shop and then they would sell them through the week or for the next few days. And then my mom's baked goods through the week. So that was another thing too. We've got to separate things. Where are they going? If you have any um, product that's perishable, you've got to kind of separate that from your hard goods, things that are like your tables and your tent that you need to store um, and they can just go into your trailer or whatever. So separating everything, taking it down, getting it organized, that could take, let's see, we, if we ended at one, we might not be done until two, 2.30. So another hour and a half. So we're at nine and a half hours. And then we got to drive home another half an hour. So 10 hours 
then you've got to put those things away. So if you make a product like we did fresh squeeze lemonade for the summer market, now we gotta clean all of our containers or my husband's done sourdough bread at the market. So then you have to clean all of, you know, you have to put everything away. Or if you left um, any of your, like my juicer, if that didn't get cleaned when we left, you gotta clean it. So the, you're looking at like, you know, if you're doing a lot at the market and all of the setup, all of the takedown, not even making the products, you're looking at like a 10 to 12 hour day on market day. That's a lot. Not to say that it's not worth it. When I actually broke down, you know, how much I was making per hour, could be in the 30 to $40 per hour range, but it's important to be realistic with your expectations of the actual time involved in bringing your products and selling them at the market. The third lesson that I learned, this goes right hand in hand with that, but being realistic and understanding the amount of time that it takes to actually produce the product. So the time constraints, they go hand in hand to make, you know, how many hours you're spending on this a week. For my product, you know, when I'm growing flowers and then arranging them, you've got something basically every single day that you're doing out on the farm, whether that's just a 15 minute walkthrough, looking at how's everything doing. Some days might turn into an hour when you realize, oh my goodness, like all the glads are blooming at once and I need to go out there and clip them now. You know, you've got something coming up every single day, whether it's taking some pictures for the, your market social media or your own personal social media. Maybe it's responding to people who are messaging you about certain things, you know, they wanna pre-order for the market. If you anticipate an hour, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, something that you're doing to care or make your products each day of the week, then those hours start adding up. For me with flower farming, you had taking care of the plants, doing fertilizer, making sure irrigation is working properly or turning it on and off, the harvesting. Then once you've harvested, it's time to arrange. Um, I could spend probably about four to five hours, I would say on a given week, to put together all of my bouquets. And that includes you know, separating everything out so that I can get started arranging making my bunches, wrapping those, cutting the stems. And then we, at the end, we started putting a water, like a reservoir bag on the ends of the stems because a lot of people were visiting or taking them, um, you know, to ants or something like that. So they needed to be able to go with water. So that added another step of making little water bags, tying those on, wrapping the bouquets, adding our sticker. So I had to anticipate beyond actually cutting the flowers, also about five hours at least to actually make up 30 bouquets and my jam jars and to get that product ready. So when you factor in, you know, all the hours of caring for the plants during the week, even though to me, because it's something that I love doing, it didn't feel like work to me. Uh, my husband can, do it, it can attest to how many hours you can spend doing that. So even if it doesn't feel like work, even if it's something that you do for a hobby, whether it's you know, raising your goats or, you know, spending time caring for your animals, it still needs to be factored in if it's something that you're doing to make money. It's something you're doing for a job. You wouldn't do it to that extent if you weren't selling your products. So you need to count those as work hours and be realistic with that and the expectations. So when you actually add up all those hours, 21 hours a week is what I was averaging on farmer's market time. So when I calculated it out and, and made about you know, $35, $40 an hour, you, that's how you get those numbers. If you aren't realistic with those expectations, then it might not look good on the business end when you start adding up the hours, start adding in the expenses, and then start looking at that hourly wage. But the only way that you can do that is by being realistic with those expectations and then sticking to you know, your time budgets and making sure that what you're selling is also making you a profit for your time. So be realistic. The fourth thing that I've learned this year, and we really, I feel like we did really well with this right from the beginning of the farmer's market, but be clear with your branding. Your brand is your business. It's, it's how your customers view your products and they view you and whether they wanna support you and whether they want to try your products, it's by how they initially see you and once they try the products, their experience with them. So I can't, I can't emphasize this enough being clear with your branding and really making an experience. Right from the beginning, we started using our Cricut to help us customize our booth. Um, in the very beginning, you know, you need a sign, you need something that says 
your name, your business name, Mountain View Family Farm, and has like some flowers, some little bits of who you are, using a font that looks cohesive to your brand and throwing in little touches. Um, we also made little signs for you know all of our products, so like our cupcakes. We used a specific font. We used our Cricut to cut it out just with some vinyl. I put that on a little chalkboard sign. So when you were shopping, like I have a thing about when you're shopping at a farmer's market or, or anywhere for that matter, when you go and you don't know how much things cost, nobody wants to, you know, you just, you don't look as closely when you feel like, oh, I don't know if these are in my budget. I don't know. You know, it just feels better as a shopper and as a consumer to know exactly what you're getting into before you start asking questions like, oh, how much are these? I would much rather people come up to our booth and they get to ask about how we raise our chickens or, oh, do you like, what do you use your herb butter for? Uh, I rather those questions rather than, oh, how much is this? For one, some people won't ask. And for two, it kind of gives a feeling like you're not confident in how much you're charging. So right off the bat, we were really clear with the messaging, like the pricing, what our products are called and making those labels, I think really helped out. Of course, you're going to have things, you know, that are seasonal where you didn't make a sign up ahead. You just came up with it the day before when my mom was baking or something like that. But it really it really adds, I think, to the look and feel of your booth. If you can just have those small little touches and customize things, it really makes a difference. Um, I can think in particular, just to up level the look of our products, we did um, cookies like in these little clear bags and we used our Cricut machine to cut out these little tags and the machine actually can like write out words for you. So we would write out chocolate chip cookie. Well, the machine did it all for us, but I typed out, you know, chocolate chip cookie and then it actually wrote them on the little tags. So for me, that was super cute. It adds a touch and they all look identical and the machine did it for me. So being able to make a bunch of tags all at once, have the machine write them out, like they look so cute. It adds to our branding of, you know, kind of that like rustic, homemade, from scratch, but still we're able to charge $6 for a pack of cookies because they look like we care about them because we do. <laughs> and I think those little touches, it really up levels your products. It makes it so you can charge what you need to charge to actually make a profit on them. Um, and it just adds to the feel. Oh, I can think too, another thing that we used our Cricut for was our uh, menu items. So one thing that I really loved was with my mom's baked goods, when she would be making, let's say like her um, chai tea cupcake, and then she had a, um, pumpkin spice cupcake, being able to have the Cricut write out like our menu list and we'd either slip it inside a little um, like a clear folder and you can just take it out each week. But it really looks nice to have it all written out in that beautiful handwriting and just a quick explanation of what what the flavors are. And especially we don't have good handwriting. Um, it's an ally. <laughs> it was really an ally for our market and our, for, for our branding. The fifth thing that I have learned this year is that it is so important to do what you love. Do something that you enjoy. Just because you have a thought or you know how to make soap or something like that, it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be the product for you to market at the farmer's market. If you do something that you love, like for me, the flowers, I love arranging flowers. It doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like I'm spending 21 hours a week on, on this part-time job. It doesn't feel like that because I'm spending the time on something that I enjoy. And it translates, 100% translates to your customers. When I have people coming up to my booth saying, oh my goodness, like your flowers are so gorgeous. Do you arrange, like do you do these yourself? And I'm like, yep, I put them together and I grew them and this is what we have this week. Like I could talk for hours about these, these blooms. I could, people have questions on growing them. They have questions about where I get the seeds. They have questions about the varieties that they are. I could talk for days about these sorts of things. So doing something that you love, it just has that good feeling. You know, when people come up and say that our booth is the most, you know, gorgeous booth at the market and you have multiple people telling you that or, or raving about your products that they've tried, it feels so good and it's so much easier um, not only to spend the time on it, but also to be passionate about your product and to know why, you know, why my bouquet costs $35 or $25 or whatever you charge. It, it makes so much more sense to be able to 
sell something that you can stand behind, you understand the value of it, your customers can understand the value of it, and they get excited about it too. I just can't emphasize it enough, doing something and making something for people that you love, it's just the best way to go. Another thing that I learned this year is that you can't judge how something does one day or at one market as a reflection on that product or how you're pricing that product. Um, what I mean by this is like you can't come up with the price of your, let's say your mugs. If you make mugs, you can't come up with the price of your mug based on how much you think people will pay or like ask your mom, like how much would you pay for this? You can't base it on that. You have to base it on how much did the materials cost? How much clay are you going through? How much time are you spending to make each one? Like not just originally making it, but the trimming down, the firing, the glazing, glazing before firing. You know what I mean? Like how much realistically do you need to charge to make a reasonable wage, you know, hourly wage or whatever to be able to make this sustainable? If it's a part-time gig, how much do you need? Do you want to make on the side, you know, with the hours you're putting in? If it's something you're doing full time, what do you need to charge for it to actually turn a profit? And it's, you know, obviously you need to get good at making the mugs. You're not just going to sell any old thing and be able to make whatever you want on it. But rather than trying to come up with your pricing based on what like some random one person thinks, or if you have all of your mugs up for sale and let's say you have them priced at like $45. I don't know what mugs should be priced, but if you have them priced for $45 and you sell two mugs, maybe you sell two mugs one week, the next week you sell six or eight. Like there is not a good way to predict how a product will do, even if you have it priced the same one week to the next. So don't make your pricing based on just, well, I think people, like I've seen people pay $5 for a soap. If your time and the ingredients you're using, maybe they're different than what someone who's charging $5 is, is doing. Like maybe you need to charge six. You can't judge it just on how it does in one market. An example of this, so we sell our chicken eggs and one market, we, we're we selling them at one price, like say we're selling them for $7. And then we, we actually went home with five dozen eggs, like five dozen eggs did not sell. The next week we completely sold out same price, same eggs. Maybe somebody at the market, you know, maybe there was a lot of eggs at the market, or maybe it just so happened that a lot of people went to a different booth first, bought their eggs first this time. And then by the time they got to ours, they already had had eggs. You know, you can't base how much you need to charge just on how it does at one day. Or if you bring a new product, just because you don't get so many takers on that first day, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make it and bring it again. You need to take feedback, um, but not just like one market or two markets. And you definitely can't do your pricing based on how it sells one time. Oh, there's so many things I could say about markets. Um, I think I want to touch on seasonality. People really love seasonality. I do personally. I love embracing the seasons where I live. We have all four seasons. So we've got a clear summer, winter, spring, fall. Like we've got every season. And I think that sometimes when we, especially in the digital age, we're just like going, going, going. And a lot of times it almost seems like seasonality gets confused with like holidays. Like people just kind of, they're living for like one holiday to the next holiday because of marketing. It's like, they want to sell products that just come out for that one season. And I think people just get kind of turned off to the idea of seasonality because they just think of like people trying to sell me things I don't need for holidays. But I think deep down, we all appreciate seasonality. We love, you know, tulips in the spring because that's when they bloom and we can't get them any other time fresh from here, from where we live. So if you have things that are, you know, blooming in your area or things that like fresh flavors, we live uh, near a lot of orchards. So like when the cherries were in season, we made cherry lemonade. Like I do fresh squeezed lemonade. It's a recipe I've had since I was a kid. We started making cherry lemonade. And during the summer, we sold hundreds of dollars at each market of fresh squeezed lemonade. So really going with seasonality and like leaning in on that. For my bouquets, of course I have seasonal flowers and what's actually blooming. 
But even coordinating like my packaging, I add a little bit of ribbon to my bouquets when I'm making those and having like the ribbon coordinate with the flowers that are blooming right now and the colors, you know, in the fall, the leaves start changing color. So people love to see like those deeper like gem tones or like rich reds or oranges and rust colors and really embracing that and just like celebrating nature and the natural changes. People love that. It's not that you're just selling a product because there's a holiday and like, oh, now it's October so we can sell candy. No, but seasonality with your products. Now I did wanna to talk to you guys a little bit before I get into some questions, cause I did ask um, on the community tab and our YouTube channel, I asked if you guys had any specific questions. But before I do, I wanted to specifically talk about income and like money that I made doing flower farming at the farmer's market. Um, you guys know that I do YouTube as well as flower farming, but out of doing uh, you know, the farmer's market, we also were able to do some special events. And this is kind of a thing that I didn't think I really would be like at that kind of a level to do events and like things kind of springing off the market um, in terms of like flowers and things that I'm really excited about. So that was definitely something that helped with the income coming from the market. I view kind of like flowers as one big business. It's like our, you know, flower growing, arranging business. And so um, that's one thing that I feel like adds to how much we make from the markets because we're getting a lot of referrals, so to speak, from them. So that's definitely something too that can add to how much you're making. Um, I already said, you know, like I made between 30 to $40 an hour with our markets. I was making, or I was doing about 21 hours a week um, and then that's how much I made. So I, we could have a market where just on the things I was making, maybe I was, you know, making between five, six, $700 a week on flowers. Um, and then I was able to make almost the same amount just on extras. So things like herb butter, herbs that I've grown, and then I turn up butter from cream, uh, add in raw garlic and salt. That was like a big hit. My husband also, he made bread for the market. He would do like 30 loaves of bread. We did lemonade for a while in the summer there and even like an iced tea with some uh, fresh uh, peach puree that we got from like local orchards here. Different things like that that I kind of sprinkled in. I was able to actually make quite a bit during the market. That's how I was able to get to that, um, spending 21 hours a week and making 30 to $40 an hour. If I actually break it down, so we use Square for our, like to take electronic payments. Like if somebody wants to pay with a card, we use Square. And it has an app so I can see like my sales in total from 2021. So I'm able to see in here exactly how much I made on different items that I had here um, listed at the market. So in my bouquet category, I had just under $5,000. I also had another one called Fresh Bouquet, about $1,400. Um, I sold wedding flowers. That's something that I kind of went into this, this year was actually doing these events. Um, and of course, weddings can definitely vary, but I made, you know, a few thousand dollars in different weddings and anniversary parties and things like that with just simple flowers, whether it was a DIY wedding or a DIY wedding course, a few hundred dollars for those. When you actually start to add it up, we made over $20,000 selling at the farmer's market. Of course, some of that is, you know, expenses, like some of that needed to go into buying seeds, buying compost, buying when we made the lemonade, some of that was buying cups or buying lemons. But if you are looking to actually make some money selling at the, the farmer's market, if you have a product that you're passionate about and you know could help people in your area, by all means, I think you should join the farmer's market. There's just so much I could say on this specific topic. I have learned so much, not only about selling at the farmer's market, but growing flowers, about my passion with flowers. And I really, you guys, I really would love to dive into arranging and doing more events. I think that that is where like my personal passion lies. So I, I definitely am gonna be, you know, taking lots of online classes and learning how to do more bigger things with flowers, more installations, more, just more. I'm so excited about it right now. But before we finish out the video, I think I've got it with my tips. If you guys have any questions for me, let me know down below. But I'm gonna go ahead and pop onto YouTube and I'm gonna let you guys know um, or answer the questions that you guys had for me. Megan says, how do you figure out how much seed to buy? planting schedule. Also, is it possible to make a living from it or is it only a side hobby? Definitely possible to make a living for it. 
but could also be done as a side hobby. Um, so we talked about that earlier, but as far as how much seed to buy in a planting schedule, it really depends on like where are you growing, like how much space do you have, and how many bouquets are you going to be able to sell. When you're first getting started, like you're not going to know how many bouquets you can sell on a weekend. So I would say grow a lot, like grow as much as your space will allow, and with the knowledge that you have, like don't try. 30 varieties of, of plants all at once and try to learn them all because you can't do it all well. But if you've got five varieties that you're really familiar with, you know you can do well, add on five more varieties for that year and do enough of them so that you can really harvest and make 10, 20, or 30 bouquets. You know, Make sure you have enough flowers to work with. And then she said, how do you know how much seed to buy in a planting schedule? I base that on the season. So if I, let's say I want to have sunflowers and I want to have them starting in, I don't know, let's say I want to have them popping up in August. That's why I want to start putting sunflowers into my bouquets. Okay, let's say I want three sunflowers in each bouquet. I'm shooting for um, 20 bouquets at my market. So three times 20. So I want 60 sunflowers each week starting in August. Okay, 60 sunflowers, August. So what you want to do is you want to count back how many days to harvest on your seed packet. Most sunflowers or a lot of sunflowers, they're like a 55, let's say 60 day to harvest. So if I want them in August, let's go back two months. And that's when I would direct seed those into the ground. So August, let's go July, June, June 1st, I'm planting out. I would definitely go more than 60. So let's say you want 75. You can put 75 or 80 seeds in the ground June 1st. That's how I know when to plant, how many to plant. You just kind of reverse engineer it. So this is what I want to have and this is when, and then go back to what each plant can do. And you really do that with every variety of plants. Um, things like zinnias, things that you can cut and they'll just come again. Um, those ones, just start them as early as you can for where your last frost date is. So like here, um, certain things like basil and marigolds and zinnias, those things like hate the cold. Like dahlias, you cannot plant those out too early or it'll just kill them. So make sure you're past your last frost date, maybe even a couple weeks past. Here, that would be about June 1st or a couple weeks past would be June 15th. I know those dates, you can look them up online. Um, if you put in your zip code, you could say last frost date calculator and then it'll have you put in your zip code if you're in the US and then it'll tell you when that date is. So when you plant, how early you can plant, things like those those really things that don't like to be cold, those you're gonna plant as soon as you can close to your last frost date for the particular variety. And then you'll just keep harvesting on those. If you have a really early last frost date, like for here, it's pretty late in the year. Like June is pretty late to just be starting planting. But if yours is in like March, you might actually consider some of those cut and come again things doing multiple planting. So maybe you start them as soon as you can in like March. Uh, it seems really early, but maybe April. <laughs> maybe you start those whenever that last frost date is. And then maybe you start a second succession for those a few months down so your plants don't get tired. But um, yeah, just planning out how much seed you're going to need by the colors you want. And then, you know, maybe I don't want all my sunflowers just on that one weekend. So maybe I'm going to start wanting different colored sunflowers the next week. So I can go ahead and plant 80 more sunflowers June, you know, June 7th. I'll plant 80 more and I'll plant them in a different color this time. So I have, we start out with yellow, then maybe we go to orange, then maybe we go to like a plum. And then that really gives you a good idea of how much seed to buy. And then, um, like how much you're gonna get for it, how much it's gonna cost you in supply cost, how much they could sell for. It's kind of how you get going. And I think with a year, I could do a whole video just on the flower farming portion of it for farmer's markets. If you really want those specific like planting tips and like how to grow and how to know how much seed and, and all that. But I wanna keep this a little more broad because everybody has different products. But if you guys have any, like if you wanna see that, let me know in the comments. Um, Camille, she says, what types of flowers seem to be the most popular? Ooh, that's hard. I would just say what's seasonal. Like people really enjoy seasonality. These, um, these flowers here, these guys are pretty popular, lilies. These are some of those flowers that like, it's a big statement. So usually when people look into a bouquet, they're like, 
oh, peonies or oh, dahlias or lilies. So having some, you know, like seasonal or bigger focal flowers, that's usually what people are excited about. And if you can put them in tones that people want at that season, but really I think that people just, they appreciate locally grown flowers. It's not just um, like one specific thing that they want. They want to see a variety. They want to have something that's fresh, that's for the season. They love tulips in the spring and daffodils in the spring. They love the peonies right after that. Um, people appreciate having something that's seasonal. Mission Lens. I wonder if her name's Lindsay. Did more people prefer to make their own bouquets or ones you already made? So in the beginning I was making, or I had like the bouquet bar, book, uh, flowers by the stem, and then the option for like pre-made bouquets. And honestly, more people preferred the bouquets that I had made. So I'm not sure if people were just unsure, like they didn't know how to mix colors or they just, I don't know, or maybe I'm just good at the, making the arrangement. I don't know. I don't know why they preferred it specifically, but in the end, I ended up completely just moving to that because there was like, I would have a bouquet bar and then I would have ones that I've already made and the ones I've already made sell out and I'm scrambling trying to make more and more and more. And then when there was other stuff going on, it was like, it was too much to try and keep up with the, like people preferred the pre-made ones. So I don't know. I don't know if it's just, they like, like how I put them together or they were just nervous to make their own or maybe they had like time constraints. I don't know they just prefer the ones I had already made. Me personally, I would much prefer a bouquet bar where I can make my arrangement, but I think that's just because I love floral design. <laughs> oh my gosh, there's so many questions on Instagram. I didn't even realize. Okay, um, let's just take a few. Do you make more than you spend in the first year? This totally depends on your setup, like what you decide to go for. If you've already got like raised beds, you've already got amended soil or pretty good soil, you don't need to add too much compost for growing. If you've got irrigation already figured out, um, you can definitely make profit in your first year. Um, as far as my personal situation, I mean, we made quite a bit this year and I know we definitely made a profit. However, it depends on how big you go. If you start out growing, you know, and you have all this space, you're paying for help with like tilling and it just, it really depends on your space. I would say don't, if you're really trying to go the flower farming route, well, it depends on the route you go. Some people build a cooler for their flowers in their first year. I'm using a refrigerator, my cooler, which is in the garage. It's just an extra one we had. I didn't have to buy one for it. Um, we, I spent a thousand dollars to fence a 40 by 40 structure for a deer proof, you know, garden area. So that was an expense, but I've been able to pay for it with, you know, what I've made for the market. So it, it just kind of depends on how you're going about it. Um, another thing that a lot of people will do, like we bought a trailer, um, but then we were able to, you know, I split the cost with my mom and that was paid for with our earnings from the market. So we have turned a profit, but it definitely, the amount of profit you make in your first year is going to be a lot lower because your expenses are so much higher. You know, next year I wouldn't have to have to buy a trailer for the market. Next year I don't have to make a 40 by 40 fenced area to protect my flowers and put a gate on and all this and that for the next year. Every year that you amend your soil with compost, it gets richer and richer. So, and it depends on the types of plants you're growing. I started every, almost everything from seed or bulb or bare root. Well, I did start everything that way. So that's going to be more affordable than if you went and, um, you know, if you bought plants that were already started or you went to a garden center and bought them retail, it's definitely going to be different. So if you really bootstrap it, um, and, and you're smart about your spending, kind of like keep a tight pocketbook, you can turn a profit the first year. Um, but it's just really going to depend on streamlining like don't try and start like 50 different types of plants uh you want to start out with a few that you know and a few new ones to learn i probably started out with too many but still turned a profit uh felicia says do you have to register yourself as a legal business in order to function at the farmer's market we did because you know you're going to need to be able to to pay taxes on your earnings so definitely need to you know get get licensed with your state, have a business license. 
although your farmer's market, like they'll take, they record your earnings and stuff. You're not like getting your earnings through them or anything. So you are directly like your business to the consumer. So you do need to pay taxes on it. I think in my state, if you make like under $500, then you wouldn't technically need a business license. But if you're really trying to make a profit at the farmer's market, like you're going to make $500 fast. Next one, selling eggs. Any tips? We have a large amount of eggs from our hens. My tips would be keep the eggs looking great. So like, you know, collect your eggs every single day. Make sure that your straw is like ample, like their nesting boxes are clean and the eggs can stay as like poo or dirt. Like if you have your chickens running around in the dirt and then they run straight into their nesting boxes, they're gonna be like stepping on the eggs and getting them all muddy. And then when you go to clean them, it's gonna take longer. And if you have white eggs, sometimes they can stain depending on what they're running around in. If it's, you know, they have like wet mud that they could get into. So I would just say, make sure that you can keep like the nesting box area clean so it's easier for you to clean up. And as far as marketing them, I think having your eggs look unique. I'll put a picture up here of our, our box. We have kind of like a vintage style carton. I showed it earlier. And then stamping your boxes, it gives your branding. And I think personally, Put your eggs in the boxes a certain way, like have them have a feel. When people come for your eggs, like they can't get those from anywhere else. Even if you care for your chickens, like even if you cared for them the exact same way that your neighbor does and your neighbor's selling her chicken eggs for $7 and yours are $8. If yours are in a cute box, yours have a cute stamp, yours are there every week, yours are clean and yours are arranged nicely, you can sense that you care a lot about the eggs that you care a lot about the, the experience for people who are supporting you. And like people will support you over the less cost. Not everybody. Some people are just always budget minded. But if you can make sure that you're pricing your eggs for sustainability to where you can stay in business and sell your eggs and share your eggs for more than just a few months until you tire out because you're only making a dollar profit a dozen. You know, if you can price them to where you can be profitable, That'd be the biggest tip right there. Megan DeLisi, she says, what was the most gratifying part of the process? Ooh, the most gratifying part for me is definitely when people come up and they look at my flowers and they're like, oh, these are gorgeous. Did you grow these or did you arrange these or whatever? That like makes my day. That makes the four hours at the market seem like it's all worth it. Like, I'm just so happy to be there and I'm so happy to feel that appreciation. You know, when somebody buys my bouquet or someone literally came up, not last market, but the market before that and bought six of my bouquets. And I'm like, oh, do you have like a special event planned? And she's like, they're for my aunts. I'm going to do like a big drop off and like special thing for them. That was amazing. The fact that she's bought my flowers before she likes, you know, she knows that the quality is good and she appreciates what I'm doing and she wanted to gift them to so many people in her life. Like that was just amazing. It just definitely, that is the most gratifying when people appreciate what I'm doing and they want to support me. So cool. Or gosh, the, the brides or brides to be that have bought my flowers and then they ask me about doing their wedding flowers. Like that is just... <sighs> Doesn't get better than that for me. Seems like you're organized and the flowers are all arranged beautifully. Hope you and your family succeed. Oh, that wasn't the question, but like, thank you so much. Um, do you have to have a special license or certification to sell food? In my state, you actually do not. You don't at the farmer's market. So um, make sure you check into your state laws. I'm here in Oregon. There's a specific law in Oregon that you can have like a home kitchen selling at a farmer's market. It's, it's something that they have like in place in legislation, at least in my county, where um, you know, they want your neighbor to be able to make her homemade tortillas and sell them to the neighbors. They, they want people to be able to do that with, with something that they've made. There are restrictions for things that have to be um, like, let's say cheesecake or something like that. You can't sell certain things that have to be like really temperature controlled, but you don't even have to have a food handler's license where I'm at to sell at the farmer's market food, which I think you should, but you don't have to. Um, and then also like eggs, there's odd things in laws. Like I can't wash, I can't not wash my eggs. Like, you know how you can leave them out on the counter. You can't do that and sell them because it's illegal. So you have to wash them 
and put them in the refrigerator and then take them to the market and I can sell them. Or um, there's certain things like if I had a cow and I milked the cow, I couldn't sell her milk at the farmer's market raw unless people come to my farm and buy it from here. I don't know. So just know your laws, look it up for your state and for your county. You can even call your county, like the, um, oh, I forgot what the department's called, but your market manager can let you know like where you should call to ask about those specific things. Okay, I'm just gonna do two more because I don't want this video to get too long. If you have any more questions, put them down below or if I missed yours. Um, this one's from Jasmine Page, best parts and worst parts, do you take your kids? Best parts, it's the feedback and it's the brides, like hands down, I love, I love the arranging. Like I love flower arranging. I love getting to interact about flowers. Um, worst parts, worst part for me is the packing up, like setting up, I just, <laughs> I would pay it like a, you know, some teenage boy that's like strong and wants to make 50 bucks every Saturday, like to set up my tables, set up the tent, hang our banner. Like I just, that kind of like muscle part, it's not my favorite. I'm more of like, I want to, I want to create with flowers. I like the artistry and the growing and the dirt part of it. Um, and I take the kids. Yes. So we have four kiddos. If you're new, my oldest is 10 and my youngest is five. So I don't like to take more than two. Like if my mom and I are both working at the booth, uh, or if my husband and I are there, I don't like to have more than two just because I don't like to let them like go around the market. And, you know, I like to have them at the booth until I can break away with them and we can like go shop the market and stuff like that, which we definitely do make time for, but you know, I can't have like three or four kids behind me and they're like, with that many kids in the small space, they'll be arguing about something, you know, in, in a four hour period, a few times. So just, you know, having one kid, that's my favorite when you can really give them attention and they feel like so useful and like they love to sell at the farmer's market. So, um, it's like a neat experience and they get to learn. They're like, we've even had them like inputting stuff on our, our square, like for checking people out. And I think they have a really fun time. Um, doing that. So yeah, I like to take, I like to take the kids. Okay. Last question, maybe too personal, but income wanting to start next year. I don't think that's too personal. No. And we talked about the income for sure. Um, in 2021, just to give you guys some income stats, some specific stats. Now, mind you, we did not, um, like we didn't do like my husband made bread on the weekends, but not every single week. But let me just give you some stats on how things sold. In Lemonade, we sold $4,500 in Lemonade over the course of the summer. In Bread, $2,792 in sourdough bread. In our Peach Iced Tea, um, $1,800. I have a few different categories for bouquets and jars. Just adding that up real quick, these different categories. So aside from events and like floral design classes and um, like wreaths and things like that, for like fresh cut flowers, my total was $7,974. And keep in mind, my season for growing and selling cut flowers is a bit small. Like my last frost date here is like June 1st and my first frost date is September 30th. So what is that? June, July, August, September, four months that I can, you know, grow and sell. So if I divided that into four months, that's just under $2,000 a month selling cut flowers at the market. Of course, like I said, I was selling, or I was making about 30 to $40 an hour doing the market that included the extra things. So like I did herb butter, my husband's done sourdough bread. Um, we did lemonade and obviously lemonade was like a big thing, like fresh squeezed lemonade. Um, definitely takes a lot of time to like <laughs> squeeze all those lemons and, and everything. But when you combine some of these things, you can make your profit higher. Before I go, this is the longest video ever. If you stick, if you stuck around this long, leave me a heart in the comments. And I want to like, especially thank you because I can't even believe you're still here. Um, but on it, like just a note at the end of the market and like reflecting in my thoughts, you can definitely make an income at the farmer's market. And my, you know, way of doing it this year was definitely like a part-time job, 21 hours a week. It's a part-time job and being able to make, you know, that much, I think it went great. If I'm going to do it again next year, what I would change 
is I think I would just do the flowers. And I'm kind of, you know, I actually through this year, I've met quite a few local growers who are also growing cut flowers, but kind of like reflecting on my short season and the, the parts of this job that I really like the most are arranging. I love working with flowers. So if I'm going to do this again next year, I think I would love to sell cut flowers again, but I think that cutting out the extras might be the best way for me to go. You guys know I also do YouTube and this is a job for me as well. So like, how many jobs do I want to have at one time? Um, and how much money realistically do I need to make? Because adding 21 hours in is like a lot. So if I'm going to do this again next year, which I think we will, then I would definitely like to just, just do the flowers only, like just only do the flowers, still team up with my mom. Like if she wants to keep doing the baked goods, makes sense. Um, but I would love to also support some other local growers. So maybe not trying to grow everything myself, but maybe, you know, a little bit before my season, buying some flowers from local, uh, local growers and being able to market like where the, where the flowers are grown at here locally in Oregon. And then as my flowers start coming on, selling those too. And then as my flowers go out, supporting the local growers. So that is kind of where I'm at uh, as far as if I were to change anything, it would probably be just supporting other local growers and extending my season and then not doing the extras, even though they can, you can make good money doing extra things that are kind of out of your area, like area of expertise. But I think I really want to niche in for next year and maybe do a little bit more in like floral design. That would be awesome. All right, guys, I think I've given you a good idea of what I've learned after my first full year at the farmer's market. Questions and comments down below. Thank you so much for sticking around with me. If you haven't already subscribed and you'd like to subscribe, and if you'd like to see my past videos about the market, seeing me making these bouquets and, and what we've done throughout the year, then I will put a couple recent videos over here. You can check those out. And I will see you guys all next week. <laughs> Bye guys.